First, first I, want to, I want to thank the Academy for this prestigious award. And I especially want to thank all the little people that helped make this possible. Oh, there goes one of them. Okay, um, so this is America's drug culture in the 60s and 70s. It's just my own personal experiences there back in the US. And it's uh, covering recreational drugs. If anybody's interested, I have this presentation up on my, my company website, but only for a few days because it's basically a very straight website. So you can um, key that in at the end of the show. I'll leave it up uh, so you can get the uh, URL. I'm going to cover it in these uh, seven or eight topics uh, about the culture and drugs, uh, books and booklets, newspapers and magazines, comic books, comedians, music, films and shows, places, events, and then the devices and the supplies. So these are the things we'll cover in the next uh, 19 minutes. First one's mind expanding books and booklets. And there's one book that I didn't include, and that's by Dr. John C. Lilly. Uh, called Center of the Cyclone. If you're really into computer programming and psychology um, and psychedelics, he was the one that actually did the isolation tanks with LSD. This book is a uh, psychedelic experience by Timothy Leary and others. Timothy Leary was a professor of psychology at Harvard University. This is his second book and the first one on psychedelics. This book basically let the cat out of the bag and really got psychedelics into the public consciousness. Carlos Castaneda did the teachings of Don Juan. Uh, as a counterpoint, it was a, an attempt, at least in some way, to get the spirituality and the, and the healthy relationship that ancient cultures had with all their different drugs. The drugs were getting into the US, but a lot of the culture and etiquette and survival mechanisms weren't. Tom Wolfe's electric Kool-Aid acid test was about Ken Kesey and the Merry Pranksters and about some pretty awesome uh, LSD trips uh, that were dissolved into the quintessential American uh, soft drink and uh, taken together. Aldous Huxley's Doors of Perception, uh, the best book that I've ever read on describing what it's like to be psychedelic. His, his way with words is phenomenal. If you ever have to explain to somebody what it's like to be electric and they're not willing to take it themselves, just have them read this book. It, it leaves me speechless. Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas was a humorous, um, fun-filled uh, story about getting stoned out of your skull and driving to Vegas and making a mess of yourself. And um, Johnny Depp was in a, a movie that Fairly well covered uh, the book uh, chapter by chapter. It's pretty hilarious for people in my, my in my age. Andrew Weil was the doctor in charge of the emergency crash clinic at Haight Ashbury in the peak of the psychedelic era. He was Jimmy Carter's advisor on drug abuse, and this is the best book I've ever read on the subject of why it's so natural and healthy for people to want to get into altered states of consciousness. Legal highs is the booklet that I uh, discovered that, that introduced me to the whole subject of plants that will get you high. I loved and worshiped this little booklet and it's thanks to that that I got into cactus and vines and shrubs and things like that. There we go. Um, this book, uh, which is on how to grow psilocybin mushrooms at home, uh, is the reason I became a surgical theater nurse because every time I tried to go psilocybin mushrooms at home, my cultures kept getting infected. Um, it's a fantastic book, and uh, since then I've just learned to work with Mother Nature. The next topic is the counterculture newspapers and magazines. This is all before the days of the internet. The only way you could get information was buying books, picking up newspapers, and things like that. So this is how we learned about things, how we communicated and networked, and and found out about books and events and things like that. First one is the East Village Other. Uh, this basically was for New York and for the East Coast of the US. It was an underground paper, a lot of radical stuff. Uh, it was more, uh, more progressive, more radical than the, uh, the Village Voice. And the cover of it says, if your heart is not in America, then get your ass out. And that's exactly what I did. The Berkeley Barb was an underground newspaper. 
um, in the San Francisco Bay Area, which is like the mecca for the hippie movement and the, the uh, psychedelic movement. It covered politics, music, art, and sex, and it got over-obsessed with sexuality after a few years and uh, alienated itself. I'm from Los Angeles. This was my underground paper, the LA Free Press. And as you can see from this sample of a front page, they got a list of all the narcs and they published their names to the public so you could figure out who was a narc and who wasn't. Uh, it was great. This newspaper also told me that poppy seeds uh, were the opium poppies. Rolling Stone magazine had Hunter S. Thompson as one of its journalists. Its focus was mostly on music and culture and art. They got so straight-laced after a couple of decades they wouldn't even print the logo for normal because it had a marijuana leaf on it. High Times Magazine was just a magazine that came out once a month, a few times a year, and it was just on drugs, just getting high. This is the very first edition, and I bought the very first edition when it first came out. I haven't seen it for quite a long time. Um, great magazine. The underground comic books, for entertainment purposes, for just turning off your head or for trying to make sense of stuff while you're stoned, the underground comic books uh, were a little surrealistic, uh, risque, and a great way to waste some time. Our Crum, Richard, Cr uh, Robert Crum, uh, did Zap Comics as well as a lot of other spin-offs, uh, and it's just surrealistic, weird, nonsensical stories that seemed to make more sense when you were high. Um, he emigrated to France, and that's the last I heard of him. I don't know if he's still in France or if he's still alive. The fabulous furry freak brothers were the quintessential three stoners. Uh, these three guys were always just trying to score some more dope, trying to pay the rent, trying to run away from the cops. And a lot of uh, stoners in the 60s and 70s could really identify with them. And many of us had experiences that were um, uncannily similar to the stories. Von Baudet's Cheech Wizard uh, seems sexist uh, by today's standards. But uh, he started off in a magazine called The National Lampoon. And um, you really have to read it in order to get the, the, the gentle, delicate balance uh, between the sexes and between uh, ruthless bastards or not. Those of you who know The Simpsons and Futurama, Matt Groening started off with Life in Hell, a comic strip that was very surrealistic. And it really helped a lot if you were on acid to see what he was trying to say in his cartoon strips. He was published in a number of underground newspapers before he got The Simpsons going in that. Subversive comedians. It was the comedians that really got the message across. Mainstream media was keeping intelligent discussion about drugs and altered states away from the general public. But you could get albums and you could attend shows of the comedians who were passing on the message and face-to-face and -face relating what they went through. One of the earliest ones was Lenny Bruce. I believe he died of a heroin overdose. But he was uh, repeatedly getting arrested for swearing on stage, even though the audience loved it, for talking about drug and, drugs and sex in a very frank and honest way. He was a real trailblazer, and he was uh, extremely controversial for that. George Carlin was phenomenal at the mindset of an intelligent stoner somebody who's done pot, somebody who's done acid, and just relating observational comedy about what the world is like from a young and challenging perspective. Jack Margolis's A Child's Garden of Grass is fantastic. Um, lots of little shorts, lots of little skits about marijuana, about drugs, um, nice sound effects, um, just an uplifting, cheerful, you know, thumbing your nose at society and someday it'll be legal and um, all that. Steve Martin has done some really great surrealistic comedy when he first started out. And if you ever hear his skit called Let's Get Small, um, it, it's, you know, so he's sort of speaking to you when you hear his Let's Get Small skit. Cheech and Chong were probably the best known stoners they sold more albums than any of the other comedians. You know, they were best known, and they just played, you know, the, the high school dropout stoners, sort of like what the Furry Freak Brothers were, but, you know, in terms of radio comedy. 
or uh, the albums that they sold. The Big Bamboo was actually a giant rolling paper that big, and some people rolled joints that big. Fire Sign Theater, if you're into psychedelics rather than pot, if you've gone to university rather than dropped out of high school, if you're a perfectionist and intellectual, you'll love Fire Sign Theater. I'm giving these guys 40 seconds because they are that good. They did incredible stuff, tightly scripted stuff, um, double entendres, triple entendres, things that stoners would get at the same time as entertaining people who'd never gotten high. Beautiful, insightful stuff. It is, uh, it is dated. It is the US. It is the 60s and the 70s. But these guys were purely and simply geniuses of comedy. Music was a big part of the drug culture and the culture in general. It helped to sort of cross-pollinate the interest in it. It was a way that people could feel connected with each other over it. Anybody over 50, stand up. Anybody 50 or older, stand up. If you remember the songs, sing along with me. <laughs> but that's just a drop in the bucket, gal, compared to losing you. And I'm down to seeds and stems again, too. Commander Cody was kind of the early rockability, rockabilly acid rock uh, band. Um, they, um, they played songs that you thought were by older, unless you listened to the words of how stony they were. New Riders of the Purple Sage, Panama Red, Panama Red, is steal your woman and he'll rob your head. Panama Red was one of the many types of marijuana. There was Acapulco Gold, Panama Red, Colombian Purple, eh. oh well, there were a lot of them. Each one had a reportedly different effect. Fraternity of Man, don't bogart that joint, my friend, pass it over to me. Uh, that was on Easy Rider, and there was a lot of people that would break into that song. As you're passing a joint around, you know, the quintessential thing to do would be to start singing this song when somebody's holding on to it too long. The Grateful Dead. Riding that train high on cocaine. Casey Jones, you better watch your speed. Uh, Grateful Dead have been around for a long time. They got a massive following. They're fantastic musicians. They're actually living in a commune. Um, Jim Stafford's Wildwood Weed. The last part, the last line of the song is after this cowboy's discovered marijuana, is growing a whole bunch of it, the government agents come to take it away and they dig it up and they burn it all. And the last line of the song is, we just smiled and waved as they went, sitting on that sack of seeds. Um, Arlo Guthrie. Uh, Fly, uh, flying into Los Angeles, bringing in a couple of keys. Please don't touch my bags, if you please, Mr. Customs Man. Arlo Guthrie's better known for Alice's Restaurant that goes on for 17 minutes and 23 seconds. Is a great song. Eric Clapton's She Don't Lie, She Don't Lie, She Don't Lie. Cocaine. I uh, was in the group Cream in the early days, a fantastic guitar player, and he helped to elevate uh, interest in cocaine amongst uh, a lot of non-previous non users. One pill makes you s larger, and one pill makes you small, but the one your mother gives you doesn't do anything at all. Jefferson Airplane's White Rabbit was like the anthem for LSD and for psychedelics in the US. It stood out head and shoulders above the rest. Films that really conveyed the message of the drug culture um, uh, were a way of getting around the censorship on TV, of being able to mass distribute stuff. A lot of times these films were not allowed in the major theaters. They had to be played in the little art house cinemas and things like that. Easy Rider had a profound expo uh, effect on me. I was, extremely I was extremely worried about ever going into the southern states of the US. And I realized that it's not a wise thing to take a big hit of acid in a cemetery during Mardi Gras. Midnight Express was based on a true story. One minute. Oh, oh. Midnight Express is based on a true story about a guy who tried to smuggle hashish out of Turkey and um, was caught in the hellish conditions of overseas prisons. Um, yeah, sort of a sobering aspect of it. Peter Sellers, I Love You, Alice B. Tokel, is the story of a, an accountant who takes marijuana and suddenly drops out. 
Fritz the Cat, the first X-rated uh, feature-length cartoon based on the comic uh, books. Fantasia, drop some acid, watch Fantasia on a big screen. It's fantastic. Some of Disney's animators took mescaline while they were making the Fantasia movie. Hair was a play, a musical. It included a, a nude scene. It was about dra dodging the draft, being drafted and getting killed. Um, it was about all kinds of stuff. Laserium was like special effects. To us, Laserium was like the fantastic thing. Take some psychedelics, sit back, watch this light show that was moving with the music. It's pretty basic by today's standards, but you know, there you go. Places. Millbrook Estate, this was a place where Timothy Leary, after he got kicked out of Harvard being a professor there, this is where he and a group of people seriously studied psychedelics. Esalen Institute, uh, it was on the west coast, just south of Southern California. It was a big psychological study research center. It um, was involved with the human potential movement. Psychedelics were wrapped up with the idea that healthy, happy people could actually go further um, through introspection, radical psychology, and psychedelics. Events. Woodstock, 32 bands, 400,000 people. Lots of sex, lots of drugs, well, not a lot of sex, but lots of drugs and lots of music. Ken Kesey, Mary Pranksters, and the bus, which is named Further. Uh, this is a, a group of people who started in California, went to the East Coast and back, dropping acid and sharing with people as they went across the country and back. In, in, you know, the hippie road show, basically. There were some devices and supplies that stand out in our culture from the 60s and 70s. The first one is the Mary Gin. This little thing in the center is a plastic cylinder. You put marijuana into it, put marijuana into it, you put the cap on it, you spin it around, all the leaf falls out, and all the seeds and stems stay inside. The isomerizer, did the isomerizer ever make it to Australia? This is a do-it-yourself kit for making hash oil at home. And lots of people bought the isomerizer and lots of people made hash oil at home without setting themselves on fire like Richard Pryor did. And the Whole Earth Catalog, which um, was like this massive catalog, mostly get back to the land, alternative self-sufficiency, do it yourself, but with a very hippie vein to it. And the Redwood City Seed Company, what um, Shaman Australis is to Australia right now, the Redwood City Seed Company was to the US in the 60s and 70s. You could get morning glory seeds and San Pedro cuttings and things like that. All kinds of plants that you were reading about in the Legal Highs book. In conclusion, it was totally gnarly. Thank you. Thank you. I think it was one of the one of the many profound outcomes of the psychedelic culture. We had things like uh, Crick and Watson, uh, Carl Sagan, the animators at Disney. Uh, Steve Jobs, the guys in Sil Silicon Valley that were inspired by the counterculture attitude as well as uh, you know, marijuana and psychedelics and that. There's a really good book on the subject of how Silicon, Silicon Valley's history from, what was the title of that? What the Dormouse Said. What the Dormouse Said, which is a line from White Rabbit. And uh, yeah, there were a lot of things that resulted from the drug culture, but the PCs sort of came in after the 70s.